right. Hello, YouTube. Let me mute as needed. Um, Mario and or Schwabe, can you hear me all right? Volume working? Welcome everybody to the Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship Program launch webinar. I'll get started in just a moment. In the meantime, I'm going to pop some new links into the chat. So Mario has arrived. Right, I will go ahead and get underway then. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Uh, you're all very welcome to the Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship Program 2022 launch webinar. My name is Rachel Ainsworth and I'll be your host today. I am the Research Software Community Manager at the Institute and I manage the fellowship program. So just some practicalities for today. If you do experience any problems with the live stream, please just put a note in the chat and we will do our best to help. Um, my colleagues Schwab and Mario are in the chat to also assist with anything and to relay anything to me. Um, but just to note that there is a small lag between the Zoom webinar and the YouTube live stream. Um, so if there are any issues, it might take a few seconds for me to get that sorted to you while the issue is relayed to me. Please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. We have a dedicated Q&A session at the end where those will get answered. This webinar will be recorded. I should have started that already, but I think it's on YouTube anyway, so it should be fine. Um, and the recording will be made immediately available on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and you can also connect with us on Twitter at Software Saved. So I'll go over to the agenda for today. I will start by introducing the Institute and then I'll tell you a lot more about the fellowship program and the application process. We will then hear from three of our fellows, Becca, Sarah, and Emma, who will tell you about their personal experiences of the fellowship program. Then at the end, we'll do our best to answer any questions that you may have and we'll wrap up at the end of the hour. So to start, I'll briefly introduce the Software Sustainability Institute. The Institute is a national facility in the UK promoting the advancement of software in research since 2010 by cultivating better, more sustainable research software to enable world-class research. And this is more specifically put in our motto, better software, better research. The Institute is a collaboration between the universities of Edinburgh, Manchester, Oxford, and Southampton, and we are very proudly supported by all seven UK research councils. The Institute is comprised of five teams, the software team helps the community to develop software that meets the needs of reliable, reproducible, and reusable research. The policy and research team collects evidence on and promotes the place of software in research and sharing with stakeholders. The training team delivers essential software skills to researchers, partnering with institutions, doctoral schools, and the community. The community team develops communities of practice by supporting the right people to understand and address topical issues, and this is where the fellowship program lies. And finally, the communications and outreach team exploits our platform to enable engagement, delivery, and uptake. The teams are involved in many different activities. Some are listed here on this slide. Um, I'll briefly talk about what the community team does. We currently have over 160 fellows within our program. We have organized over 30 workshops, including 13 collaborations workshops, which I'll briefly talk about towards the end of my presentation. The Institute leads and engages in these types of activities because the UK research community relies on software. And this is evidenced by a survey that the Institute conducted in 2014. Over 400 researchers responded to the survey and replied overwhelmingly that they use research software, and a majority also said that their research would not be possible without software. The Institute's mission is therefore to help researchers improve and continue their work through cultivating better, more sustainable research software. 
So now let's talk about the fellowship program. Why does the Institute have a fellowship program? Well, it's a really great way to engage with natural ambassadors of better software practices from the research community. The promotion of better and more sustainable software is best done by those already within the domains. We are able to support those involved with improving software practice and helping them form communities of practice. In return, fellows help the Institute discover important information about software in different research domains, and they help guide our training policies, community work, and consultancy engagements. So who are we looking for for our fellows? Applications are very welcome from all research domains and all career stages. So whether you're in phase one of your career, such as a PhD candidate or a junior research software engineer, or in a higher phase of your career, such as a professor or a director, and every phase in between, we would really love to receive your application. Your application will also be assessed taking your career phase into account. So you don't have to worry about being judged against people from uh, more experienced phases of, of, of their careers. Here's a breakdown of some of the demographics from previous years. We have a nice spread across gender, although this can always be improved. And we always want to encourage those from underrepresented backgrounds to apply. We have a wide spread of people from various career stages as well, although many of our fellows are early to mid-career. We would like to encourage those in more experienced roles to apply as well, because you have a lot of influence when it comes to policy and getting better research practices enacted in your domains and institutions. The Institute is funded by the UK Research Councils, so we strongly encourage those supported by AHRC, BBSRC, EPSRC, and the rest of the uh, funding councils supported by UK Research and Innovation to apply. However, applicants supported by other funders are also extremely welcome, such as those through their institutions, the Wellcome Trust, the EU, or other international funding agencies. Again, because the Institute is funded by the UK Research Councils, we are looking for applicants who are based in the UK or have a formal affiliation with a UK-based institution or office. However, I am very excited to announce that the 2020 round will be a pilot for opening up the program to international applicants. And I'll expand on this a lot more later in the presentation, but in short, we will have up to three places for successful international applicants. Regardless of where you are based, your plans for the fellowship must be primarily focused on improving UK capacity and capability and potentially include promoting a UK-based approach abroad. Again, I'll discuss what all that means for international applicants later in the presentation. To be eligible uh, for the fellowship, you should be one or more of the following. You could be a researcher who uses software. You could be a developer who writes tools for researchers. You could be a research software engineer who supports the work of researchers with software. You could be an advocate for best practice in software use for your research domain. You could be in a leadership role in research projects or organizations that make heavy use of software. You could be a user of research software or you could be passionate about software in research in any way. So in summary, we are looking for champions of improved software practice within their domains and institutions and effective collaborators. So you should enjoy working with others and be good at promoting your work to a wide audience, such as through organizing events, outreach, blogging, social media, and so on. We look at your contributions to your communities, such as through software, papers, presentations, data sets, and so on. And we look at whether you can communicate your ideas beyond your specialization. And something for you to consider when you're applying is, do you have time to engage? The program requires around 10 days in the year of being involved in what we call win-win activities. So that is activities that benefit you and also activities that benefit the Institute. And I'll talk a bit more about those um, types of activities uh, a little bit later. So then finally, some other things that you could be involved with um, but are not mandatory is that you could be an advocate of open and reproducible research. You can be involved in communities of practice, um, either as a member or a founder or a contributor. Uh, some examples of communities of practice include communities such as the Mozilla Open Leaders, our OpenSci, and the Turing Way. You could also optionally collaborate with or take on an existing fellow's work. So are you a natural successor to an existing project, or do you already collaborate with any of our existing fellows? Uh, you can view our, uh, their profiles on our website uh, for further information on the type of work that they do. So some of the things that we expect from fellows who are in phase one of their career, such as PhD students or junior research software engineers, 
include having the time and inclination to contribute to the community, uh, to engage with your research or domain or institution, to attend and organize events, whether in person or online, share your experiences, insights, and outputs from your event participation, use your platform as a fellow to promote better software practice and research, align with and promote the Institute and its mission, and attend any required events. And again, I'll touch more on those um, in a little bit. Some of the things that we expect from fellows who are in sort of the middle phases of their career, such as postdocs, research associates, lecturers, readers, um, research software engineers, or more senior research software engineers, or research software group leaders, um, include everything from the previous slide, as well as helping to seed or nurture a community of practice in a research software related area, running workshops to promote software training or best practice in your domain or institution, or if you work with other fellows on this, Optionally, you could contribute to policy, give a talk on behalf of the Institute, or you could undertake carpentry instructor training. And then some of the things that we expect from fellows uh, who are in a more um, experienced phase of their career, such as from professors, directors, chief data science, scientists, and so on, include everything from the previous two slides, as well as organizing and sharing networking events to help create policy on Institute priorities, such as better software, more recognition of software development and developers in research and software in the reproducible research agenda. Uh, promoting the Institute's mission to research leaders in your institutions, research councils and government, and possible attendance at Institute advisor, advisory board meetings and co-review of the outputs from earlier career phase of fellows. However, we are also open to any other suggestions fellows have for activities. If none of those activities resonate with you, please do get in touch. We are always very happy to discuss your ideas as well, and we are very interested to hear them. But our promise to you is that we will listen, we will be responsive, we will work with you as one of our team, and we will support you and your work and ideas as a fellow. We will be fair and flexible where possible, and we will help you to deliver your community development skills. So what are some of the benefits of being an Institute Fellow? You'll receive a 3,000 pound event fund, raise your profile and have your opinion heard. You can organize and attend events. You can present your work. There will be opportunities to gain teaching experience and training. There are publishing opportunities, both formal and informal, such as through our website. You can join a dynamic network of fellows. Um, and this is the one that I really like to highlight because our community is very supportive and engaging. Uh, you can also gain higher visibility within your institution, which can lead to potential new collaborations. And you can be considered a thought leader in your area. And of course, we offer a platform to influence research software policy. So what are some of the requirements of being a Software Sustainability Institute Fellow? If offered the fellowship, you will have to agree to the 2022 terms and conditions document, which you will be sent um, along with your offer. You'll be expected to write a blog post for each supported activity. And I'll talk about that um, on the next slide. You're expected to attend the fellowship program inaugural meeting, which is an opportunity to meet Institute staff and the other fellows within your cohort. You're expected to take part in a midterm review so that we can see how you're doing with your fellowship and see where we can offer you more support. You can attend the collaborations workshop, which I'll also talk more about in a minute. You can attend uh, Institute Fellows community calls when you're able. Um, these are on pause at the minute, but we hope to be starting them back up soon. You can attend an open fellows meeting when we're able to offer those. The last one that we did was in person. And you can take part in a survey on your participation in the fellowship program, and this will help us improve the program in future years. So coming back to the requirement about the blog posts for supporting activities, once fellows have used their funds to attend a conference or run a workshop or any other activity, they're expected to write a blog post. And this is because blog posts not only report your activity and what you've done, but it also allows you to disseminate that information to a wider community and also point towards other resources. They are the main output that is read by those who visit the Institute website, and we get over 20,000 visitors a month. You're also very welcome to contribute any other blog posts in addition to this, such as about your expertise or any advice, and blog posts also encourage outreach skills development. So here's the timeline for the 2022 fellowship program. 
Um, the next important date is, of course, Sunday, the 31st of October, which is when our applications close, our deadline for applications. We aim to let applicants know if they are shortlisted or not by November 23rd. Shortlisted candidates will then be invited to participate in the online selection day, which is a full day of group activities where candidates will be assessed on their skills relating to communication and interaction, collaboration and group work, event planning, and how they engage within the activities. This year, the online selection day will take place on Thursday, the 2nd of December from 10.30 to 4 p.m. And we will provide breaks throughout the day. And if you are unable to make that due to um, a clash, don't let that put you off applying. If not enough people can attend that day, then we'll arrange an alternative date. But if possible, do please save this date. The final selection of fellows uh, will then be made on the combined assessment of the candidates' performances during the online selection day and the fellowship plans proposed in their screencast applications. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. We will make the formal offers of the fellowship to successful candidates by December 13th, and then we will make the official announcement of our 2022 cohort in January when you can officially start your activities. So now I'll talk a bit about the application process. The application form can be found at this link and it's also linked from our website. The main part of the application is a six minute maximum voiceover of a slide presentation screencast and reviewers will base the bulk of their decision on it. So what this means is that you'll make a slide presentation and then record yourself speaking over it. And we have provided guidance on our website for how to do this. During shortlisting, your application will be assessed based on your plans for the fellowship. So that will count towards 50% of your assessment on ambassadorship. So how, um, how much you are an ambassador of uh, better software practices in your domain and the style and content of your presentation. Plans should include details around how the fellowship will be leveraged to achieve your goals, such as specificity around activities, costs, and target domain, community, or audience. So we do ask you to please be as specific as possible in your plans for the fellowship. We suggest that you spend one minute describing who you are professionally, around one minute describing what you do, and we suggest dedicating four minutes to describing your plans for the fellowship, although you can um, decide to spend more time on any one section. So some examples of previous fellows activities are listed on this slide. Um, things such as the GLAM Data Science Network has been organized by uh, 2020 fellow Jess Cope. A workshop on GUIs for research software was organized by 2020 fellow Diego Alonso Alvarez. Um, we have supported activities uh, with regards to open life science uh, led by Malvika Sharan and Yo Yehudi. And we've got quite a few more examples there as well. Um, including several workshops and resources that have been inspired by the carpentries, such as Library Carpentries by uh, James Park Baker. We do have some considerations in light of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We do encourage applicants to consider that travel and in-person events might all, not always be feasible um, when proposing plans for the fellowship. So we do particularly welcome plans with online-based activities, such as organizing and attending online workshops, attending virtual conferences, or the use of software and some small hardware to enhance online events and activities, such as um, microphones or um, you know, software to enhance your events, such as Slido. You can read more about how our fellows have adapted their plans to make the most of their fellowships in the COVID-19 world on the Institute's blog. So the exciting part. Um, the Fellowship Program 2022 round will be a pilot for opening up the program to international applicants. So this is the first time um, that applicants who are based outside of the UK or without a formal affiliation with a UK-based institution or office will be eligible to apply. Um, I do want to note that we have only um, we can only offer up to three places uh, for successful international applicants. Um, and this is a pilot to help us identify and address challenges for opening and scaling up the program internationally in the future, particularly around finances and logistics. So because the Institute is UK funded, applicants who are not based in the UK or do not have a formal affiliation with a UK based institution or office will need to demonstrate that their plans for the fellowship have a focus on improving UK capability and promote a UK based 
and promote UK-based approaches abroad. So for example, how will the goals of your plans benefit the UK research community? For example, your plans might have a focus on feeding in successful research software related initiatives or approaches from abroad into UK-based projects. Um, I think a good example of this would be um, approaches around data stewardship, um, which has been um, heavily researched in other areas um, if you feed that back into UK-based projects. Um, adding capacity to do particular tasks, uh, tasks and collaborate with UK-based teams and promoting UK-based initiatives, projects, or way of working abroad. So a good example of this is promoting, for example, the research software engineering movement abroad or other collaborative uh, ways of working or projects abroad. Um, I do have to note that changes to eligibility um, with regards to the international fellowship uh, pilot is subject to new information that we learn along the way. Um, financially, there may be exclusion of some countries or regions due to applicable laws or restrictions around the movement of funds. There will likely be some additional steps in the administration of funds and small discrepancies in the reimbursement of expenses due to different um, currency exchange rates. Um, you should also demonstrate how your fellowship can successfully deliver on its plans if there are potential challenges related to time zones, language barriers, or the cost of having to travel large distances. And these are all areas that we are looking to explore and address through this pilot. So we really appreciate um, your help with this and we look forward to solving these challenges together. I do wanna note, however, that the fellowship does not support paying for hardware such as laptops or computers or for staff time for developing software. The fellowship is primarily focused on supporting you at, for, and leading events. So for example, bringing people together to talk about the best way to integrate different codes as a workshop is within scope, but paying for the staff time to design it is not. Um, and if you do have any questions about your specific plans for the fellowship, or you're not sure if they would be eligible, feel free to send us an email and we're happy to discuss any specifics with you. So some of the required events uh, for the fellows that I mentioned before include the fellows inaugural meeting. New fellows will be expected to attend this. Um, it's likely to take place in either January or February of 2022. Um, and we'll let you know <laughs> if it's in person, online or hybrid. Um, we're still assessing the situation. Um, but this is where you'll be introduced to the Institute staff and find out the details around administration of the fellowship. It's also a really wonderful opportunity to network with the other fellows in your cohort. And you can read more about last year's inaugural meeting um, at this link here. Collaborations workshop um, is another thing that you can attend. It is the signature annual and conference event run by the Institute, which brings together the entire research software community in order to explore best practices and the future of research software. So um, collaborations workshop 2022 will take place in April. Um, it, they will have keynotes, discussion groups, many workshops and more, um, but the, the details will be announced within the coming months. Um, and I'd like to note here that all shortlisted candidates um, to the fellowship program will receive free registration and then financial assistance will be available to those who need it to participate. And then finally, there is the continuing fellowship. So once you become an Institute Fellow, you're always an Institute Fellow. And the benefits of this include that there is a communal pot for attending or organizing events. Um, once you're beyond your initial inaugural year as a fellow, you still have access to some of this funding. Um, you will still be asked for your opinions and there's still plenty of opportunities to network within the fellows community. Your influence will continue. For example, there will be opportunities for you to act as a reviewer or help us to recruit fellows in the next cohort. Um, so here's a list of links. Um, we'll make sure that we get them copied into the chat or um, there's a link to the slides already in the chat. Um, and there are lots of ways that you can um, connect and uh, contact us. If you want to see an example uh, terms and conditions document, that's also linked there, as well as a playlist of um, last, some of last year's successful um, screencast applications. But without further ado, I would love to hand over to some of our fellows to hear about their experiences firsthand. Uh, we have Becca Wilson, a 2016 fellow, Sarah Gibson, a 2020 fellow, and Emma Rand was kind enough to send in a pre-recorded talk for us. Um, she's also a 2020 fellow. Um, so first, I would like to hand over to Becca. I'll just check that my microphone's working. 
Sounds great. Um, you have to bear with me because I'm not usually on a Windows machine. <laughs> I don't know when. No worries. <laughs> um, right. So I'm hoping that my presentation is now up. Yes. Yep. Cool. Okay. Right. So um, hi, everyone. Um, I am um, a UKRI Innovation Fellow at University of Liverpool, and I was an SSI Fellow in the 2016 cohort. And I thought I'd basically start with just um, a brief outline of my very non-traditional route into the um, SSI Fellowship uh, programme. So my background, I'm actually a graduate in geology. I love things like fieldwork, and um, I basically wanted to be Indiana Jones, but in space, trying to find life on other planets. Um, my planned PhD was going to be analysing some uh, mission data from a mission to Mars. Um, sadly, what happened was it crash landed, and so I couldn't do that. So I ended up doing a wet lab chemistry based PhD on astrobiology and looking at um, how life started on Earth and potentially elsewhere. Um, and unfortunately, the banking crisis in the mid 2000s um, put a stop to my planned career in astrobiology. Uh, and what happened was after my PhD, I pivoted into um, something that was much more computational, which was in uh, the area of atmospheric science and also um, analyzing data from um, chemical transport modeling and um, some earth observation data as well. And so really this was the time in my life when I started um, to gain some skills in, um, I guess, uh, programming and stuff like that. But I guess like a lot of people that enter research software engineering, there was no real formal training. Uh, it, most of it was self-taught on the job, uh, trying to deal with basically massive amounts of data um, and, you know, learning uh, things like Linux and um, learning how to use R, which wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very broadly used at the time. And so it was very difficult to find support for those sorts of things. Um, I had a brief time away from research, working in science communication and also on research commercialization projects in the university. But I did find my way back into research five years post PhD, where I had an opportunity to join a completely different domain again, um, which was in health sciences. And um, basically, I was taken on as a postdoc to um, help build some R libraries that were um, bespoke and tailored for the epidemiological community. And it was around this time that I'd heard of the SSI. <laughs> and in 2014, I did actually apply to be in the 2015 cohort uh, for the SSI fellows and sadly was shot down in flames. Um, and well, I was I, I did make it to interview stage, but uh, I, I didn't make it through into the cohort. But what was interesting was at the interview day, um, I found out about the SSI open call in, uh, that was uh, designed to basically uh, provide some uh, SSI um, time or expertise tailored to particular um, projects. And so I actually um, did get an application in and I was awarded some SSI time to help uh, basically my research project to try and find a way to make our our libraries that were tailored for epidemiology more sustainable and to try and start growing a community around that particular piece of software. Um, so just on a personal note, um, something that happened to me across this time period was that um, I suddenly found myself disabled and um, becoming a wheelchair user. And so I was juggling that sort of um, that, that becoming disabled with trying to manage my career and uh, managing that whole process all at the same time. And there was a point probably where I thought to myself that, you know, do I still really want to carry on um, working in particularly ac acad academia? But um, I decided, yes, I was going to still do that. And so um, I applied for a second time to the SSI Fellows Program, and I was successful in joining the 2016 cohort. So um, my fellowship goals were largely uh, based on my experience of moving from this space research domain. Um, this is kind of like a picture of how things were in around 2013, 2014, um, basically in the context of how the space research domain sort of handled data, the sorts of analysis tools that were available to people, the kinds of mechanisms we had for data access, 
and also the data archiving processes we, we had in the domain at the time. Compared to when I entered the health sciences domain, particularly epidemiology, I suppose, um, a comparison between how things were being done in that domain. And uh, to be honest, it was quite scary and overwhelming at the differences between these domains, um, where I was really used to like um, a very structured and well-maintained uh, data, basically process of data archiving, and also even collecting the data was very um was very, it was done in a very structured way uh, to entering a domain where it was kind of, um, I, I wouldn't say quite a free for all, but it was very, very uh, free and loose with how the, the, the you know, the, the process of collection and, and, and maintaining those data sets and archiving and, and giving people access to them. And so pretty much my fellowship, the idea of my fellowship was to try and find ways to bridge this void between these two domains, because I felt like the health sciences domain could really learn a lot from, um, you know, the other more data intensive domains uh, and to try and, you know, bring uh, some of the best, pra best practice um, into that domain to, to influence it and make it a bit easier to use the data in the future. So during the course of my fellowship, I got to attend all of the sorts of events that um, Rachel has already told you about. Um, and I also had access to, I couldn't attend, unfortunately, any of the software carpentry sessions, but I had access to all of the training materials. So I actually did quite a lot of self, self learning as well during that time period. And the actual funding, um, I have to say that I didn't actually use all my funding. I think I used only half of my funding and somehow um, I forgot to use the rest of it. But um, I used the funding to attend a couple of conferences, namely the Use R conference, um, because the libraries that I was building were based in R. And so it made sense to go and present that and get feedback from the wider R community. Um, and then I also attended some research meetings um, related to data sharing, particularly uh, the RDA, the Research Data Alliance meetings. And pretty much I just learned loads of tools, loads of processes, loads of um, techniques and methodologies and things that I pretty much just enacted in my own research, my research project and convinced other people in my department also to, to adopt those. So the impact of my SSI journey, um, and I include, you know, that failed attempt to becoming a fellow, the open the, the results of the open core and my um, journeys following my fellowship in 2016 as well. The biggest impact has been um, the fact that I've actually grown an open source community in this you know, R-based research project uh, called Data Shield that I've been working on for a very long time now, I think about seven years. Um, and pretty much you know, where that project started when I first got my fellowship, it was a very small project, a couple of researchers, it was just a few um, R libraries brought together and we were offering one-to-one -one support to users of those libraries. Whereas now we're a proper open source community, um, we've got over 50 contributors to the software, and we've got um, a lot more people contributing as well to the sort of ethical and the legal um, side of the of, of data sharing pretty much in, in health, health research. And we've got users all over the world. It, it's being used as an pl analytical platform within epidemiology for, for people that want to um, share and analyze data across Europe. Um, so it, it's, it's had a profound impact basically on the projects that I work on and on, on my career. Um, so on my personal career, um, in terms of the impact of being involved with the SSI, so I think it's that um, direction and instruction that helped me with my research projects that has actually also facilitated me gaining two research fellowships. So that's the fellowship that I'm currently on with UKRI. And also earlier this year, I was awarded a tenure track fellowship with my university um, that will begin in two years time. And the research underpinning those fellowships is all based on this, um, these R libraries that have now converted into this lovely community and um, open source software project. Um, I've also been um, excited to have delivered a couple of keynote um, talks and um, sort of panel chair invitations through the SSI as well. Um, so I did give the keynote last year on data privacy and health research uh, for the collaborations workshop. And um, yeah, I chaired the um, a diversity and research software engineering panel uh, this year. And I've had, and then because just because of other people seeing those to the, those talks and things online, I've been um, uh, I've been invited to give other talks in sort of like associated spaces. 
Uh, I've also been invited to sit on various advisory boards, a couple are on the more technical side of things, and um, the other one is on the public engagement side of things. And last year, um, I have to say that a career highlight of mine was that um, I actually appeared on the Shore Trust Disability Power 100 list. Um, and this is a list of the 100 most influential disabled people in Britain. And I was one of just four people that appeared in the category of science. Um, and basically this was because of the work that I do around highlighting, um, uh, highlighting and representing basically disabled people in um, my domain. Uh, off the back of uh, being featured in the list, um, I got invited to participate in a um, few pieces of policy work, um, not strictly around research software engineering, I have to say, but um, around diversity in STEM more broadly, and also around the diversity of engagement with UK Parliament. So I'm just going to summarise um, at, at the end here, just what I think are the biggest benefits and advantages of joining this fellowship programme. So first of all, you'd get to join a super inclusive community. Um, and that's not, not just super inclusive in terms of like, you know, protected characteristics, but inclusive in terms of across different domains, across different career stages, um, and across different sectors, including people that sit outside of academia. Um, I follow lots of SSI fellows on Twitter and basically they end up being my filter for like research, software engineering and techie news, which is great because I often don't have the time to keep up with stuff that's going on outside of my own little research bubble. Um, and I do pick up quite a few new sort of like software apps, tools or something from that, um, from that, those, those Twitter accounts. So that's really great. Um, it is a community. Um, there's quite a lot of us, and basically it means that if you ever post a question anywhere, or if you ask a question at one of the events, there's often lots of people that have ideas about how you can fix whatever the issue is that you're having. Um, and so because of that, I'm always constantly learning from the community. Um, I have been involved since, yeah, 20, about 2015, 2016, and I'm still learning from everyone else, basically. Um, there's lots of support not just in terms of the advice, um, but I know that Rachel did highlight that there, sometimes you can propose, um, you can make some proposals uh, to, the, to the SSI and they might be able to sponsor, for example, events that you have uh, and things that you want to do in the future, as long as they align with um, the SSI goals. And um, the last thing is that it's, the SSI also gives you an opportunity for advocacy. If there's any particular issues that you want to raise, from the community or from your own, um, I guess, your own domain or your own sort of, I guess, research or a little bubble, um, is that, you know, there are mechanisms to do that, either through speaking invitations at the various um, events or through writing blog posts and having them published on the blog. And so I'm going to end on something that Rachel also included in her talk, which I didn't realise, which was the words that someone told me on my very first SSI interview day, um, which was that once you're an SSI fellow, you are always an SSI fellow. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, I'll give a virtual round of applause. Um, yeah, I think it was really important and I appreciate you sharing that you had applied before um, but were unsuccessful, unsuccessful and applied again because um, this actually happens a lot. Um, a lot of uh, applicants um, end up being successful in subsequent years, even if they're not um, successful the first time. So if you have applied before um, and were unsuccessful, please do apply again. Um, we would love to receive your application. Um, very quickly before handing back, um, handing over to Sarah, there is a question uh, for you, Becca, in the chat. Um, did you find the SSI fellowship feedback, if any, on your initial application helpful or constructive for your subsequent fellowship application and SSI open call application? I, do you know what? I actually can't remember what my feedback was. <laughs> it feels like, I mean, it is, is coming up to almost 10 years ago. It was quite a long time ago. This is really bad. I do remember one thing was around engagement because I wasn't already engaged in the SSI community because obviously I'd come from I'd only just also just started that transition into the health research domain so I was new in my research domain that I was working in but also I hadn't 
really engaged with the SSI prior to applying for that. Um, and so I think that that was something that I did. Def I do remember taking that on board after the interview day. Um, I don't know if explicitly it was it was said in the feedback. But that's that's what I left the interview day realizing because I think a lot of the other um, people that were being interviewed were perhaps more already sort of engaging or had attended some events, for example, before and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your talk, Becca. Another virtual round of applause. Um, next, I will hand over to Sarah Gibson. Thank you very much. Let me just get my slides up. And everyone can see that? Yes. Brilliant. So hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Gibson. Uh, just a little bit about me, um, some of the various activities I'm involved with. I'm co-contributor to both the Turing Way project and the Jupyter Hub and Binder project. And I'm an operator of mybinder.org, which I'm sure many people are familiar with if you're um, working in computational research. Mybinder.org lets you run your notebooks in the cloud in a reproducible environment. I was previously a research software engineer at the Alan Turing Institute in the UK, and I'm now an open source infrastructure engineer at 2i2c, and I'm a member of the 2020 cohort of fellows. So what was my fellowship plans about? Um, so I, this was very, it was about a year after I joined the um, Binder community. And I was quite keen to diversify the community of people who are contributing to Binder and specifically connecting with like the Julia and R um, communities to bring in their expertise. And the reason I thought this was important was because um, Binder and Jupyter is this multi-platform, uh, multi-language, multilingual tool, but the people who maintain and build Python, uh, sorry, Binder, mostly work in Python. And that means when we have issues and feature requests from people not in the Python community, it means we're not as well placed to help them work through that. So I thought it was really important that we got some engagement from these communities so that we could make the best possible platform for everybody. And I plan to do this by connecting with what I called the Jupyter communities. So attending um, conferences run by the, the Julia, Python and R communities. Um, to basically tell them about what Binder is, how it was operating. Um, we just run a user survey. So we, um, I presented the results of that. And I was just like making myself known in those communities that I was open to hearing them and to connecting them in the community and making their onboarding into Binder as easy as possible. I also um, had plans to host a workshop that would be either a train the trainer style um, workshop on helping educators leverage Binder for their courses, or um, a build a Binder Hub workshop, which would help people get set up with their own Binder services um, to help facilitate reproducible uh, research in their communities. So how did that work out? Well, I was awarded my fellowship uh, in January 2020. I spent February 2020 furiously writing abstracts to meet various mission deadlines and then pandemic happened and the whole world kind of came um, grounding to a halt and we didn't really know where we were with all of these various events and such. But actually considering that I, I did deliver on my um, first goal of my fellowship and I did speak at um, all the three conferences that I applied to but I it was a global pandemic I, I was pretty burnt out I didn't capitalize as well as I could have done on those talks um, it was very early on in lockdowns these events were ones that have that very quickly pivoted from being in person to being remote events and that's not to say that, that the organizers did a bad job, but I just, nobody was expecting to have to make that pivot. And um, so I didn't really as engage as much as I intended to do had the world not turned upside down. I also didn't go on to run the workshop either. Um, although I have run versions at different events through communities. 
So what else happened during my time as a fellow? Um, I had a job change as well, um, which is like a big upheaval to do, um, uh, especially when you're, you're like trying to meet certain goals of a fellowship. But um, actually this wasn't as disastrous as it could have been since I'd scoped around an open source project. And I've been very lucky to have been awarded um, a diversity and inclusion and equity grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Institute coming up this year, um, which will put me as the community strategic lead of the Jupiter Hub community. And that proposal has a lot of crossover with my original proposal for the fellowship. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can rescope my fellowship a little bit to like pick a specific set of um, you know, tasks we can do and basically fulfill both of these um, grants in one go. But the point I'm making here is that the SSI are very familiar with precarity, particularly of an academic career path. And they're very open to discussing changes to proposals during the course of the fellowship. If like me, you end up changing um, your priorities or your job position or something. So would I change anything about my um, SSI fellowship? Um, not how I approached this fellowship. Um, there was a pandemic, there's a pandemic going on. And um, I think I did the right thing of like, not putting too much more on my plate. And actually I should have probably taken a little bit more off. However, if I were applying today, I'd probably submit a different proposal to um, the, the one I've described. I'm not quite sure exactly um but yeah i'd definitely think a bit more um about how i would go about um achieving those goals so what does a, com a commitment to being an ssi fellow look like rachel already described a lot of these events um so outside of doing your fellowship goal there uh, your fellowship there is the collaborations workshop which i recommend everybody attend even if you're not a fellow because they're awesome there's the monthly community calls where we can get together and um, SSI fellows can link up and see how they can help each other, but also the SSI team can um, learn how they can better support us as well. There's general advocacy and representation as you go about your um, being awesome in your domains and blog posts as well that Rachel covered. Um, a really good way of disseminating knowledge and just raising visibility of your work. So my advice to anybody thinking about applying for the fellowship is to scope tightly and to scope well. It's a £3,000 grant and a six minute application video. Um, so if you're struggling to explain your goals in those six minutes, then um, I'd, I'd take another go, go at scoping that in. Um, as mentioned before as well, um, I'd scope for distributed and remote, we're still in an ongoing pandemic and um, events are most likely to be remote and distributed, um, at least for a while. And if you're lucky enough to get the fellowship as well, I would, my advice would be try to avoid the I haven't spent it guilt. As Becca said, she only spent half of hers. I think so far I've only spent like £80 on one ticket <laughs> from mine. Um, but my point is your participation in the community is far more valuable to the SSI than spending their money. So that's like the hard bit out of the way. Again, what are the benefits of being an SSI fellow? You get to join a community of like-minded peers across domains. We're all like working towards the same goal. That's like, we need better research and uh, better software and better research, but everybody's coming at it from a slightly different perspective, which is super interesting and fun fantastic. You get to build your reputation as like the best practices expert in your domain. And that opens up a whole um, possibilities of career progression opportunities and boosts confidence as well. Um, I, I know that sounds a little bit vague. Um, so I'm going to give the example of the version of Sarah that joined the Turing Institute about two and a half, three years ago, would be really intimidated by the version of Sarah that I showed on the first slide of my talk. So like at some point during this journey, um, I've managed to be self-intimidated intimidated to becoming self-intimidating. Um, and the fellowship was 
a component of that as well. And like, I didn't just wake up and decide, hey, I'm going to be an SSI fellow because I've decided what actually happened was I was doing a lot of events and activities already with Binder, with the Turing Way, that are the kind of activities that the SSI want to celebrate and uphold. Um, and so I applied and I was successful and through the support and the encouragement and the community of the SSI, I, you have this self-realization that actually you are a bit of a badass. Um, so that would be my um, take home message is if you're wondering like this feels all well and good for those people, but I'm not SSI material. It's just that you are, if you're at this webinar it's because you've been interested by what the SSI does and you feel a synergy there um, so I'd just like to say good luck to everybody who applies and do reach out if you have any questions my Twitter handle is on my slides thank you very much amazing thank you so much Sarah virtual round of applause um, and also thank you for highlighting um, the guilt of not spending all of the fellowship I know um, Becca also mentioned that um, here at the SSI we're here to support our fellows um, and especially during the pandemic we ended up extending the fellowship duration to, to support the fellows and, and help them um, maximize the impact of their fellowship so thank you for, for highlighting that and um, we try to be as flexible as, as possible um, yeah, so thank you so much to you both. I'm now going to um, share Emma's um, pre-recorded talk. So just bear with me for a moment. Hi, uh, my name is Emma Rand. I'm from the Department of Biology at the University of York. I hope you're enjoying the launch webinar. I am a nine, 2020 um, Software Sustainability Institute Fellow and I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you my experience of that programme. So I'll start off just by giving you a little bit of my background, just for context. Um, then I'll tell you what my fellowship plans are about, and then what my progress has been, and what the additional benefits are of uh, joining the programme. So I'm a biologist by training, so not a software engineer or a computer scientist. Um, I specialise in data analysis and reproducibility for a number of different biological domains. And I'm on the R Forwards core team. Uh, R Forwards is the R Foundation's task force for um, equality, diversity and inclusion amongst R users and developers. And because I'm interested in data analysis teaching in general, I decided to do the carpentry training a couple of years ago and that's where I found out about the fellowship programme and was encouraged to apply and I'm really glad that I did. So my fellowship plans were based on um, the observation that uh, labs, biological labs, research labs get moved forward because of the influx of new talent who bring their skills and expertise to that lab and they leave them in that lab when they, even when they move on. And for laboratory science and field science, this is largely achieved by writing protocols and so on, um, which get left in the lab even when the postdoc or PhD student moves on. However, I noticed that this was not as prevalent with uh, data analysis type skills. And this is because even though many Undergraduate programmes and PhD programmes now include elements of data analysis teaching within them. They rarely include those skills of uh, documenting software and um, distributing software, packaging it up, um, which are exactly the skills we need for those, those data skills to be left in the lab. So my programme was based on developing the capacity of PhD students to infect their labs with reproducibility so that um, those skills got left in the lab more easily. So progress. Um, some of the events have not uh, yet happened because of COVID-19. Um, and I'm really happy to say that the SSI has been incredibly supportive and flexible with respect to COVID-19. Uh, has extended the deadline a little bit for us and come up with novel ideas 
to help us do different things with our money. Um, but I have developed a six module program which has been delivered online twice, uh, which focuses on reproducible analyses in R. And the delivery of that was through GatherTown, uh, which was funded by my fellowship. And I also found out about GatherTown and first used it at the Collaborations Workshop in 2021. And you can read more about that training in this blog post that's on the Software Sustainability Institute website. So the other things I've done um, is been able to happily attend uh, conferences, online conferences, without having to spend my own money, which is what I normally have to do, um, depending on how much money there is in grant or in de departmental funds to fund these things. So I've been to both USARs recently, which was great, um, and the Bioconductor Conference and the European um, R Conference. Normally I'd probably only get to one of these in a year, as opposed to being able to go to all of them. And of course, the fellowship programme includes your uh, participation of the collaborations workshops. So I've done that twice and I really highly recommend those. Even if you're not successful in your fellowship, it's a really great experience where you'll get to meet lots of uh, fun, positive people doing cool things. Um, so what else have I gained? I think it's really an impressively supportive and inclusive culture and network. Um, so you'll meet lots of people who have a, a huge array of skills, um, who are, are willing to inspire and teach you some of those skills. So I found out about lots of really fun and cool projects through my interactions on the uh, fellowship network. I've used some of these things I've learned in the Forwards organisation and we now run package development modules which are fully online. And we also ran a, what we call a incubator at USAR 2021 about R in the research software engineering uh, community. And we modelled that very much on uh, the collaborations workshop, although it was much shorter in length. So I feel like I've had lots of opportunities through the SSI and I've also met some great collaborators which have led on to some really good things. So one of these is a project called Cloudspan, which is a over half a million pound grant from UKRI, uh, which is with James Chong from the University of York and Neil Chu Hong from the Software Sustainability Institute. And this program trains researchers in high performance computing for omics analysis. Uh, it employs uh, several people, I think there's nine people on the team now, uh, so that's been a really great thing that I've got out of this fellowship. And then I've also got funding from the Scottish Funding Council through the Software Sustainability Institute um, with fellow, fellow, fellow Andrew Stewart from 2019 to develop Carpentry's material for statistics in public health, which is misspelt on my slide there. So in short, uh, I think you should definitely apply. It's been a really worthwhile um, activity for me and I'd really recommend it. And my email address is there. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about the programme from a fellow's point of view. Uh, thank you and enjoy your day. So just a huge round of virtual round of applause for Emma. Thank you so much for sending in your um, recording for that. I very much appreciate it. Um, and now I'm, I am running behind uh, because I talked a lot earlier. So let me go back to presenting my slides. Share my screen again. Right. So um, if you want to hear or read about um, any more uh, fellowship experiences, um, there are lots of blog posts on our website. Um, you can check out the uh, community call playlist to hear updates from fellows. Um, and all of these are linked from the slides, um, which should be shared in the chat and on our website as well. So um, now is the time to answer questions, but I haven't seen any come in in the chat that we haven't already answered. If you do want to ask a question, feel free to pop it in the chat and we can answer it here. Um, 
I think until I see a question pop up, I will um, just quickly finish my slide since we're at the top of the hour. Um, but yeah, do feel free to add any questions to the YouTube chat and I'll hang out um, and answer them in case I, I go over time. The application form is at this link here and also linked from our website. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who attended this webinar um, and asked questions in the chat, um, but especially thank you to Becca, Sarah, and Emma for sharing their fellowship experiences with us. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, and then a huge thanks to the Institute team for um, helping out today and with some of the slides, as, and also thank you to our funders. Um, these slides are available on Zenodo, um, linked uh, here on the slide and in the chat and on the website. And this recording will be made available immediately um, afterwards. Um, if you do have any further questions about the fellowship program that we weren't able to address today, um, do feel free to email us at fellows-management-at-software.ac.uk. And I will go back to answer some questions that have come through or comments. Um, so um, actually we've got, so we've got two questions. So can the fellowship cover time spent preparing workshops, for example, creating carpentry lessons? So um, the fellowship does not pay for staff time, um, but it can pay for helpers, like workshop helpers. Um, so there is scope for this. Um, we would probably discuss this on a case by case basis with you on how exactly um, this funding would be um, provided. Um, but in general, staff time is not covered, but help for workshops um, and like training events is. Um, there's another question. Great talks, everyone. And then to Becca and Sarah, um, how did you come up with your fellowship plans and ideas? So I go, I go first, I suppose. Um, so my fellowship plans were pretty much, um, I guess, evolved from the fact that I was thrown in at the deep end by moving into a completely alien domain. <laughs> moving as I said into health research and then just seeing this big difference in the way that data was um, treated and handled and collected um, and just it was kind of yeah it was the shock of that I think that <laughs> made me start to think okay there must be a better way of doing things let me think about looking in other domains let's go and find some advice and that's how I came across the SSI in the first place was trying to find advice about kind of what to do um, that was mine. I think mine came from um, the more like ubiquitous problem in open source in that it's a lot of volunteer time and sometimes there are certain types of problems you might see in your community or in your software projects that you just think, ah, oh, if I had the time and resources to address that, I would love to. And um, that's where that's why I saw the SSI as being a good um, fit for my desire to want to bring more communities in as it was um, an advocacy role. And it was about going out into communities and telling people that this is cool thing that people like to use and how can we make it beneficial to you as well. Great, thank you both. Um, I'll just quickly mention that I'm also a fellow of 2019. So um, when I was coming up with my plans, um, yeah, kind of similar to Sarah, I was applying for funding for all of the things that my normal funding stream wouldn't support. So a lot of this was attending um, and engaging in um, the open research community and, and events and things like that. Um, so so yeah, attending conferences and, and things like that back when travel was, was a big a big expense, um, but things have changed now. So um, a lot of fellows have been spending um, the fellowship funds on, you know, small equipment such as, um, you know, microphones or lighting for, for hosting online events or um, software subscriptions such as Zoom or Slido or uh, Gather Town and things like that. So, so there's some, um, yeah. Um, next question. 
how many fellows do you select per year? Uh, so we select between 15 and 19 fellows each year. And just a reminder that we will have up to three places for international applicants this year, um, for successful international applicants this year. So the next question is, what um, is the weightage of the interview and application in the selection? So um, to get you through shortlisting your application, um, uh, the assessment is based 100% on the application to get you through shortlisting. Um, once you're shortlisted, you'll be invited to the online selection day, which is the interview day. Um, and then your fellowship plans um, from your application will count in your final um, selection assessment at about 30% and uh, the rest of the 70% will come on your performance during the online selection day. And next question. Um, thanks everyone for the talks. How would you encourage new people to attend virtual best practice workshops, especially with Zoom fatigue? Um, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> One that I would also like to know the answer to. Um, at the moment, all events are still pretty much online. So I think there's not a whole lot that can be done for that at the minute. But my suggestion um, for online events is make them as interactive as possible. Um, I you know I personally really struggle to um, engage if it's 100% presentations, you know, if you have some element or a lot of elements of, of participant interaction, such as, you know, discussion groups and breakout rooms and things like that, I think that's really helpful. Um, I don't know if Sarah or Becca want to throw in an answer if they've experienced good practice anywhere. Yeah, I think in the, certainly in the collaborations workshop, um, just because that's so different to the normal sort of conferences and workshops that I attend, I think it's just the high level of interactivity. You're always breaking out into sort of smaller groups or like a couple of people um, to, go, to go and work on things. And it's different types of things that you're working on each time. So changing the task that you're doing or changing your focus. Um, but I also really like um, all the different, like <laughs> the really random social events part of different like online programs nowadays is quite interesting, you know, ranging from like quizzes to, I heard um, just at a meeting the other day, someone had organized a scavenger hunt where like the virtual participants had to find things in their own house as part of the scavenger hunt and explain how those items fit the bill basically. Um, but I really enjoyed things like the remotely green um, that will run at the, um, the collaborations workshop this year. Uh, and actually we're going to adopt that <laughs> so for one of our events. Oh, that's <laughs> so think, yeah, it's, it's, that interactivity really helps. Uh, yeah, I would just add as well, like, if you're worried about Zoom fatigue, don't use Zoom. Um, I think a lot of um, a lot of conferences as well of it, there's been like this move towards Gather Town because you can create really fun environments that are you still have some control over in terms of who can hear who and such like that. Um, and I, I think this has opened up a way to be really creative with the kinds of events that you run as well. So um See, it's an opportunity, not so much of a challenge. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then there's one final question um, for Becca. I'm curious how similar your original proposal was to the final successful one. Were the fellowship plans similar? Was your engagement with the SSI the major change? So I think that um my original plans were probably not as well formulated. I think that I hadn't given, in my first application, hadn't actually given as much thought as to, um, I guess, how I could explore potential solutions to my particular problem um, in terms of finding out best practice. Whereas having gone then to the interview and then engaged with the SSI about other things, um, I kind of, I learned sort of like which, say, for example, conferences might perhaps give me the information that I needed to bring back to my particular research project. Um, so I, I do think that my second application was a lot better than my first application. Thank you so much. And I am going to leave it there for today because um, 
I have done at the time because I was so excited about talking about the international um, application information. Um, but I want to say again a huge thank you to Sarah and Becca for um, sticking around and answering questions with me and for for sharing your experiences. Um, there's a lot of comments in the chat um, thanking you a lot for 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 sharing. So very much appreciated and um, thank you to everybody um, who have been watching from YouTube. I hope you all have a great day and we look forward to receiving your applications. Again, don't hesitate to email us um, if you do have any further questions and I'll add um, that contact detail in the chat again. So thank you again.